reading from Mark chapter 15. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. I do believe that you know me well. I am perhaps the most well-known of all the items that were involved in the crucifixion of your Savior, Jesus. By well-known, I mean that I am an item that all of you, no doubt, have had some personal experience with. I am, of course, a nail. But not just any nail. I am a crucifixion nail. My descendants have certainly changed a bit in the 2,000 years since my time of notoriety and fame. Nails in your day and age are much more sophisticated, so many sizes, from very tiny to quite large. It's the large ones that I relate to. I have to say, I kind of admire that invention that exists in this modern time. I'm talking about the nail gun. What a thing. Talk about doing something with authority. The nail gun gets the job done. Although I am still partial to my partner, the hammer. Like us nails, hammers also come in different shapes and sizes. And in the right hands, the two of us, a hammer and a nail, we can get the job done. And who can forget the sound that we put out when we're working together? Clang, clang, clang. Well, the real sound is something to be heard. I must say, there is something that I have struggled with over the time of my existence ever since I was invented. I have struggled a bit with pride, partly because I've been a staple for buildings for a long, long time. By staple, I mean a very basic necessity. And I am still, after all these years, after several millennia to be exact, I am still one of the most needed implements in the building business. I suppose my pride can also stem from the fact that my name, Nail, has even made it into your language in other ways. For example, when someone gets in trouble, you sometimes say, they got nailed. If someone is trying to understand something or trying to come to a conclusion about something, I've heard some of your people say something like, we've got to nail this down. Or if someone does a really good job at something, sometimes people say, they nailed it, meaning they got it. Or they might say, you hit the nail on the head if they said or did the right thing. So I'm everywhere. I'm part of life. And I'm depended upon by everyone from housewives to master carpenters. I've been known to cause a flat tire. I've also been the reason that many of you have had to receive a tetanus shot. It's enough to really go to your head and I do have a head. I'm sharp, I'm strong and hard, I'm durable, I can take a beating. In fact, I'm perfectly willing to take a beating. That's part of the reason that I exist. But there was a time in history that really caused me and my fellow nails to become quite arrogant, you might say. It was a time when the Romans were in charge. It was the same time that the one that you call your Lord and Savior, lived on the earth. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. That was my heyday. I was what you might call the co-star of the most brutal form of execution known to man at the time. The star of the show was the cross. But I was the co-star. And just between you and me, 
that cross was almost useless without me. I was the one who made crucifixion possible. I was the one involved in doing the unthinkable. I was used in a way that I wasn't originally invented for. The original idea for my existence was that I was a tool to be used on other inanimate objects. I have no idea who came up with the idea of driving me into the flesh of a human being in order to hang them on a cross. But whoever, but however this idea came about, it certainly didn't help in the whole humility area of my life. It only added to my pride and arrogance. I was not only an instrument that many people appreciated and depended upon, but I soon became something that many people feared. They cringed when they saw me at work on Golgotha, the place where many crucifixions took place. But there's something I need to share with you since I have your attention. I no longer with, live with the pride and the arrogance that once characterized my, my personality. There was a day about 2,000 years ago, a Friday to be exact, when I was about to be on again. Three men were being crucified that day. Two of the men had arrived at the place of the crucifixion, but the third one seemed to be taking an extra long time getting to Golgotha. When he finally appeared on the hill, I was surprised to see someone else carrying his cross. I knew this other guy couldn't be the one to be crucified because he looked just fine, other than being exhausted from the journey to Golgotha. It was the other man who I knew was to be crucified he was the one who had obviously been flogged. In fact, he looked like he was already near death, very weak and bloody, stumbling along as the soldiers continued to beat him and mock him. When he and his cross finally got to the spot, he seemed almost relieved to get there. As they stretched him out on the cross, one soldier reached for me as I lay there on the dusty ground. He took a firm grasp of me with one hand, while the other hand held my partner the hammer. Two of the soldiers stretched his arms out as far as possible. As the soldier who held me and the hammer placed me at the right spot on Jesus' wrist, I felt an apprehension that I had never felt before. I didn't want to go through with it. Actually, I didn't want to go through him. It wasn't fear of the hammer or anything like that. As I said, I was built to take the hammer blows just fine. Something just seemed different about this crucifixion. It seemed wrong and right at the same time. But before I knew it, here came the hammer. It seemed like it was moving in slow motion, like something dramatic was about to take place. It was a simultaneous thing. As the hammer struck my head, the sharp end of my body pierced his skin. With professional accuracy, the soldier placed me just where I needed to be to do the job. I pierced Jesus' skin and a few muscle fibers. I crushed his main nerve going to his hand, which brought about that familiar scream that I was so accustomed to hearing. As I passed right between the bones in his lower arm, this is what made it possible for a person to actually hang on me. Then with a few more blows of the hammer, I entered the wood of the cross. After all three of the nails were pounded into his hands and feet and driven securely into the cross, the soldiers stood the cross upright and placed it into its spot. Thus began the agony of crucifixion. I had been used many times for crucifixions, but this time just felt odd. Jesus seemed, at one and the same time, extremely weak and yet extremely strong. It's hard to explain. It was obvious that he had already lost a lot of blood from the flogging. He was dehydrated. His flesh was torn to ribbons. So he was definitely weak in his body. But his spirit... His spirit seemed as strong as ever. Usually at these crucifixions, the victim is weak in body and in spirit. They had reached the end. 
But with Jesus, it was as though this was the greatest moment so far in his life. He hung there with a strength and a certainty. Usually in my experience with crucifixions, I knew that I was doing the work. I was the one who held the person to the cross. And I felt the strain of their body on me. And because of my size and strength, I could handle the job. We nails are tough. But with Jesus, the one you call your Savior and Lord, it just felt different. If I didn't know any better, it felt as though I hardly had anything to do at all. It was like some other force was holding him to that cross. In fact, I remember thinking to myself, this man could come off of this cross at any moment if he wanted to. Like I had no say so whatsoever. Quite a humbling thing for someone like me who used to feel so in charge at crucifixions. But clearly I was not in charge at this crucifixion. And dare I say, neither were the soldiers or Pontius Pilate or the Jewish leaders. It was Almighty God who was in charge. And Jesus, his son, was a willing participant in the whole thing. It's like he was fulfilling his purpose or something. That reminds me of a passage from Isaiah that I'm sure as believers you know very well. It alludes to the role that I would play in the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. The passage goes this way. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's not talking about me. I have no soul. I'm just a piece of iron forged into a shape to do a job. This passage is talking about you. He went to the cross on purpose. I didn't hold Jesus to that cross that day. His love for you is what held him to that cross. You were on his mind the entire time. It was like I was just a prop. At least that's how it felt anyway. Although Jesus had become a real human being, so he certainly did feel the agony of being crucified and nailed to a cross. So if this is the reason for my existence that I somehow played a small role in bringing about the forgiveness of sins for the whole world and securing a place in heaven for you, then so be it. I will accept that role in history with humility. By the time eternity comes and heaven is a reality, I don't think I will exist anymore. I will probably have been reduced to rust and ash or whatever happens to iron over the years. But there's one thing that will exist forever and ever for all eternity so that you can know what your Savior experienced for you. I'm referring to the scars that I caused to be on his hands and feet. Your Savior has kept these, even in his resurrected state. They are a reminder of the reality of the nails and of the cross, that the crucifixion really did occur. And he has kept his scars to be an eternal reminder. Not a reminder of my role, but a reminder of his amazing grace and love for you. And so I will end my talk with a reference to his resurrection scars. It says in the Gospel of John, Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Amen.